Good morning, everyone, and welcome to a joint webinar um, a collaboration between uh, Newmark uh, and IBM. Um, I'm Adam Green, uh, Director of Consulting uh, for, for Europe with our, our European tech team, um, and I'm delighted today to uh, be joined by some uh, very special colleagues from IBM um, in the form of Paul Gatland, uh, Paul Russell, and uh, Priyash Kamani. Um, thank you guys for taking the time out to, uh, to talk today. Um, really appreciate it. Um, it's worth noting that um, Newmark and IBM work very closely together across the globe in a number of different engagements. Um utilizing the, the IBM Trireka platform, um, which uh, for those of you who don't know, is one of the world's leading RGMS platforms. Um, and uh, uh, we've done very well together in sort of implementing both from a, a client side in, in an old in an old world pool, uh, PR, uh, but also collaborating um, in, in, within Newmark as well in the in the not so sort of, um, uh, well, in very recent times, I think this year and last year around sort of UK clients as well for Trireka implementations. Um, and uh, and Priyash and I have, have also done some work um, in Europe a long, long time ago in a former guys, but no, really, really good to have you guys here with me um, today. And what we're going to talk about um, is uh, the hybrid office strategy. Um, and uh, and how we're looking at um, different models that employ uh, companies can can look at to sort of encourage and um, provide new space um, and tackle a different set of drivers that they're seeing in in sort of corporate real estate around um, bringing their people back to work um, and adding a bit of agility to their portfolio um, with obviously the the event or the pandemic we're sort of experiencing at the moment. So we're going to have a, a quite a lighthearted discussion around that. Talk about some of the social economical um, impacts around this, but also look at how technology can support in that process both. For from a um, certain selection perspective, uh, but also from a management and monitoring perspective um, in terms of getting locations set up. Um, so um, we're going to get straight into it um, and hopefully drive some, some great conversation, provide you all with some, some really good insights um, around this around this topic. So um, without further ado, um, I'm going to drive us through this uh, and get us going. Um, so I think what we've seen, um, guys, um, in, in the last sort of nine months is, uh, I suppose, a form of agility in terms of how companies have reacted to uh, to being thrust into um, sort of a pandemic situation and talk about what's sort of working um, and how they sort of keep sort of operations moving. Um, and I think for all of us, you know, we're probably all used to working from home in our, in our own roles, but we've seen organizations that have been sort of adopting a percentage of work from home um, sort of really move into um, a much larger percentage of their workforce adopting this probably through necessity more than anything to get operations running um, uh, and, and we all know work from home isn't a new thing, um, but we're seeing it being accelerated um, sh sh massively by, by, the, by the pandemic um, and also the tools and, and, and elements they need to sort of adopt to, to successfully work from home, uh, but also the impacts, both sort of positive and negative of that. Uh, but we know it's not a, a, new, a new scenario um, and we know it's not a, um, you know, a new thing for companies to do. But I guess the expansion and the adoption of it has just been, you know, on, on a colossal scale through necessity. Like I said, more than anything. Um, but that's one of our major trends. I think now the conversation is moving towards the, what do we do next, um, with some sort of eye on a type of stability moving forward. And it'd be great to hear from the from the panel. We we'll call it the panel. Um, what sort of other trends we're seeing starting to emerge from this space um, now that we've had sort of nine months of home working, we're now looking towards some sort of stability or new normal or normality in the sort of next sort of year to the two, three, four, five years as we come out of this. Um, be great to understand sort of what you guys are seeing from a trend perspective in that space um, and what sort of companies are starting to think about and what they should think about. So I'll open that one up to uh, to, to you guys. They're formulating their answers. Yeah, I mean, thank you, Adam, and um, it's it's great. If um, it's great to be part of this um, webinar today with you. Um, and to your question, I think that the biggest trend is uh, is people thinking a little bit more diversely about you know their plan to return to the office. So you you talk about hybrid, and I think people you know quite rightly have, have done this already. You know, IBM is is been doing this for years, um, but I think the new change. Is probably is there a, is there another way to achieve hybrid working and at the same time deal with lots of other um, issues that we never really saw in one place. So I've never noticed before conversations with, for example, medical and health professionals when we the, the workspace, and that's been happening in the last few months. So I think the audience or the decision makers has changed, um, all, almost certainly for the better, because now we're getting a much more three hundred and sixty degree view of what the workplace needs to be, whereas traditionally it was 
firmly in facilities, operations, a bit of IT, HR was sort of out there somewhere, but it wasn't really a cohesive plan. And I think now organizations, IBM is one, you know, really now think about this as one, one strategy. And of course that makes it much easier for people like us and yourself who've got tools and platforms that can help because actually we've built a lot of capability into what we do that actually addresses all of those, those stakeholders. And I think just from my point of view, I think there's there's it, it depends on the core industry. I think in the tech world, then I think we're all used to working at home. And really for us, apart from, uh, I think, being a fairly lengthy time working from home, and normally that would split between home and the office, just working from home is something we're quite used to. But if you look at perhaps, perhaps finance or, or legal uh, sectors, they're now working from home and it's a whole new world for them. They've never had to do that before. So I think there's a whole you know, cultural shift about how they deal with working from home. But uh, I think, you know, the net result is, uh, you know, it's a whole, you know, change in lifestyle. Uh, you know, some folks I know uh, like it, some want to get back to the office. So it's, 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 it, yeah, it, it's, it's certainly a very interesting uh, state at the moment. And I think uh, one of the things that's happened, and this has happened in IBM, even though we're an IT company, is understanding how quickly you can react. So having the data in place to say who can work from home, who has the ability, depending on the territory you're in, obviously in the UK, everyone typically has internet at home, but in other countries they don't. So do they have the ability to even execute their job at home? Now, until now, that was held in lots of different places and they're pulling that data together now to make those decisions, taking health into account, access to technology, the ability to, to, to replicate the applications they use in the office back at home. The other thing is having cohesive playbooks for different circumstances. So we're, we're dealing with the pandemic at the moment and, and I've been up with our playbook and anyone can use it. But this isn't the only disaster that can happen. Like, how do you react to earthquakes or floods or other things? Can you have pre-built um, projects in place and, and, and react to them more quickly? Because I think some industries, as Paul was saying, the legal industry, some really struggled. I think public sector, for example, local government really struggled to react quick enough when the first lockdown happened. So I think that's the big change we've seen is that they're having a much more cohesive strategy to deal with this kind of thing moving forward. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think you touched on a few things there that I wanted to pick up on. So I think digital mobility is one. So we're lucky to be in a very connected nation. I think that's one. So we have the ability to grab a laptop, find a seat and, and get working to a level of productivity. I think that's really a really good point, Priyash. Um, the other, I guess, is um, I think traditionally sort of real estate has been a very sort of rigid asset class um, and its agility has always come from how the space within them is being used. Um, but when you find that you can't access that agility and that space, um, what, do you, what do you do? And, you know, the answer is, you know, luckily enough, we can grab laptops, we can get home um, and we can do that, do that work. And I think we saw that in, you know, that massive rush in in February, March to, to sort of keep the wheels turning. Um, we were very fortunate in that respect. Being a, a predominantly sort of service driven economy um, we could we could do that very quickly and I think you know the the impact has definitely been isolated um, to certain sectors to, to, to PR's point around um, different organizations different functions being um, impacted differently um, so it's 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 been a very quite a diverse impact it's probably one way of sort of saying it. it's been impacting people in, in lots of different ways um, but I guess you know we talk about that being used to home working um, we're sort of seeing a pre-covid I mean the numbers vary whatever article you read, right, it's 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 a huge variance. But 37% sort of pre-COVID working from home or enjoying those flexible work benefits um, because they have the sort of um, level of um, education and, and job type, they can do that. But also their sort of platform to work from. And then we're going to see that move to sort of more of like a 56% um, who want flexible work benefits moving forward. I mean, who knows, that number could be a whole lot bigger. It could be a whole lot smaller, depending on people's preferences. Um, but we've talked before about sort of that length of time working from home um, PG. Um, usually you have a break, right? You maybe go to the office a couple of days a week or you'd be out to see a client. Whereas what we've experienced is prolonged periods of time sat in, you know, if we're lucky enough to have a home office, you know, which is a luxury for some and, you know, but there's no doubt it's a luxury. Um, you've got people sort of working from home on their kitchen tables. Um, you've got people who've just started roles 
um, grabbing a space where they can, having a laptop delivered to them in the, in the post, for example. Um, so that's their sort of experiences of this whole piece. Um, and I guess what we're looking at is what real estate models moving forward can provide, you know, a sanctuary closer to where people live for them to access and to work in the ways they need to and maybe escape some of the sort of um, the, the, the working from home elements such as, you know, children, especially when the schools are out, big challenge for some people, um, but also, you know, the daily chores of, of life, pets, you know, trying to be disciplined and focused in terms of what you're doing um, from day to day uh, perspective, focus work, collaboration has been taking a big hit. Um, and, and people are sort of maybe in that sort of discovery mode around what really, really want, they really want. Um, but like what we are seeing, I guess, with now everyone having been off work for a period of time, that flexible work, people have had a taste of it and they like it. Um, and that's going to stay with us moving forward. So now what we've got is a brand new set of employee-driven drivers for real estate professionals to try and try and tackle and try and handle. Um, and I think what we're we're seeing, and I'll, I'll put it out again, maybe to, to 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 PR, is around the impact of not being in the office um, and that work at home piece the impact on things like productivity, collaboration, that social interaction, because we are social animals at the end of the day. Um, it'd be great to get your take on um, uh, on, on the social elements and, uh, of, the, of the scenario we currently find ourselves in. Yeah, no, it's interesting, Adam. And I think, you know, I'm just looking, sitting here in my in my uh, spare bedroom, you know, doing this call, and I look at the, you know, the, 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 the meterage that, se- that surrounds me, um, that, you know, someone in IBM's organization from a real estate point of view would be looking at space in obviously inside our buildings. And, you know, w- what is their shift to understand the space I'm in? Because it's completely different. And whilst I always probably had the ability to do that, um, now there are so many new factors. So how can they, I suppose, in a way, capture from me and others what's going on? Because mm-hmm. is what's going on relevant to how they are going to redesign the workplace or leave it as it is? Um, provide different ways for me to, you know, as, as Paul said, I think to get out of the house and find other ways um, where I can collaborate, but maybe travel less. Um, so mm-hmm. in this kind of paradigm shift, if it, if there is going to be a paradigm shift, how do real estate professionals, you know, reach out to find out, you know, what's going on? And and you already start to see lots of new ways of doing surveys, um, you know, asking people to feedback what they like and what they dislike. And then using that data to inform the real estate professionals in terms of what do I do with my offices? And there's a big debate, I think, and I think it's just a debate. Do I need less space or do I need more? Um, Mm. And, you know, that is got to be a huge challenge for real estate because are they going to consolidate what I've got because I can, it's a cost saving or actually do I need more because my my strategy is to space people out more or provide different working environments. And and whilst I don't think there's one answer and there never will be, I think these are uppermost in people's minds. And I guess it's down to ourselves to help and consult and to advise and just give people a more of a diverse way of thinking about this. So I think it's fascinating. And I think the, the, the nub of it is how do we understand our customers better? Yeah, I think it's a really good point, right? And I think, I think, um, I think Priyesh, um, if I had to ask you specifically, um, obviously having being used to working from home, but if I said to you, um, Priyesh, what are your drivers for getting back into the office? Assuming you have some, of course. But I think for for <laughs> as you might like working from home, I think a lot of people do now. They've had that that sort of element of it. But I guess for you, um, within sort of you know a leading technology business, leading global technology business, and in the sort of IDMS sort of workplace world from a tech perspective. Um, what do you think and what are your drivers for getting back in, into the office? So, well, it'll be different things for different people. But for, mm. for, for me personally, I think what employers have started to understand, and this is, gonna, this is going to reflect back into the office as well as we move back, is the mental health of, of the individual and the mental health of the Damn. employee and what tools can we give people to to re-add that social interaction while we're away from work but some of those tools will then carry back into the office so personally i live on my own so during the first lockdown I, there was no support bubble so i was just here on my own so what could we do or what could i you know the, the the business do um to to give me that social interaction even though i don't physically have that so lots of tools have come into place um and i think lots of companies are looking at you know how do we do that um, how do we use collaborative tooling better? 
um, how do we not just use video conferencing, but you know, the fact that everyone started to share their video at the start of the year, most people wouldn't keep their video on. Um, and people have become much more comfortable with that. And it's because you need that social interaction and this is part of that. So I think that's gonna become, you know, much more normalized as you get back into the office, having mixed meetings where people, some people are present, some people are on video, um, that whole thing. Collaboration is gonna become easier across territory just because those toolings have been put into place and it, it's become normalized. So you'll just use those ongoing. The some of the things that employees were pushing back against until now, they've now, they'll now realize and some employees will realize actually that gives us some really good value uh, especially as uh, PR would say, you know, to help um, deal with customers where you can't see them or, or um, you know, save save costs on travel, you know, pandemic or not. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I, I, I feel your pain about the sort of living on your own piece in the first pandemic, I think, because again, we work from home. So I was, I think, two weeks into a work from home stint and then lockdown came. And I think I was probably on my own for... 10 12 weeks you know and i you know i was climbing the walls mate i'll be honest you know it's 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 tough um and and there's such a vast demographic of of people and how those the, the sort of lockdown impacted them um differently i think for those living on their own it was maybe whether they're professional you know they had work to distract them um, they could collaborate online i still think that the the mental impact um is is a huge thing and i guess you know now that we're sort of in a tiered system at least in the uk for our uk you know, for listeners and obviously for those listening beyond the uk we're in a tiered system now where you know we we at least get out we can social bubble um we can obviously go to the office in a controlled manner as well and there are tools and platforms in place to help us with that piece um because you know we are social animals and we want to see people um and a, and a huge part of that is is in our core working day, so the eight, you know, eight, nine, ten hours um, that we we spend working every day, um, part of the the draw of the office is the people that we meet when we're in them, the conversations that we have, um, but also the types of work that we need to do. And I think you're right. I think as we sort of get that confidence and that trust element back, um, we'll start to see people going back into locations, um, but they can have that mix of sort of in the meeting room and then digitally in the meeting room as well, and and maybe. Maybe this scenario has broken down at certain elements of not taboo, that's the wrong word, but maybe barriers or confidence levels with, you know, cameras being on, talking to, to bigger audiences through through WebEx or, or, or Zoom or Teams or, you know, pick your pick your solution. Um, I think I saw the other day, actually, um, I think I saw a graph that showed the adoption of, um, of Teams specifically. Um, went up 894% um, in sort of February, March, as we sort of bedded into our work from home scenario. So tools certainly have helped us get through this this um, this this platform, but they've only sustained us for so long, I think. Um, and now we're in a, a space where we're seeing companies talk to us about sort of missing out on collaboration and innovation. We, we did a poll um, sort of just to, to help us support this, um, this webinar. Um, and the core sort of voting was focused around collaboration and innovation and how people are missing that. You know, you can talk about it on a WebEx, but being in a room, whiteboard, post-it notes, you know, PR knows that's this sort of stuff. That's thought leadership, design thinking piece, um, product development. Um, people are missing that. Uh, but also, they have friends at work. They haven't seen for ages. You know, you, you have friends at work um, and, and and they're missing those sort of social interactions, but also the activities on the periphery of, of locations, whether it be going out for dinner, going to the pub afterwards, um, you, know, you know, those things are missing. Um, but also, you know, the economy is missing them as well, which is a whole different webinar we could talk about and spend lots of time around it. Um, um, as well. But I mean, we have a new set now of employee driven needs around sort of space. You know, we do see the office um, demand reaching its pre COVID levels. The different challenge is it's now going to have to reinvent itself from a workplace perspective and talk about sort of what function it delivers to its people um, as, you know, those those office visits or those office interactions will be limited to maybe a subset of, 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 of work types, whether it be collaboration, face-to-face, -face, focus work days, or maybe even just a change of scenery. Um, it's going to be a, a, you know, a, a big shift. Um, and, the, and the millions of pounds spent in sort of designing great places to work sort of over the last sort of 10 years and that sort of workplace revolution, um, I don't think, I don't think, companies will want to waste that investment. They'll want to try and maximize and utilize that investment where, where they can. And I guess um, 
I guess the reinvention again of the office has been is maybe been driven by by this scenario. So so it's absolutely fascinating. Um, but to experience a workplace, you've got to get to an office, and and maybe now you know we've all known that in the past that commute's been a challenge, um, uh, and if we can shorten that commute by by bringing space to the people i suppose in a way through those employee driven sort of um uh, factors that's probably the next tackle or next challenge we're seeing that cre companies have to tackle or CRE organizations have to tackle sorry um to sort of maybe sort of supplement or support that return to work piece um so we've got jane here who's our sort of storyboard employee um but like what i want to try and do is talk around the scenarios here maybe maybe pg um around um the new drivers for the office. So really focusing in on that sort of that balance between sort of home life and work life um, and, and what those, those new drivers are. And then we'll get into talking about the commute in a little bit more detail. So great to hear your insights around that, uh, PG. Yeah, no, and th thanks, Adam. Um, I, I guess look, looking at, uh, at Jane as a persona, uh, working for a large bank. So Jane would have spent most of her time pre-COVID in the office, and now she's not in the office. And I guess it's just looking at what that right blend is. You know, I, I think there, there's there's always the uh, I think the one of the parts you miss is just around uh, you know those like water cooler type conversations. You know, mm. just just talking to colleagues that you don't really have the opportunity to as easily when you're working from home. Um, I mean, a couple of the things I made a couple of notes here as you was you was talking, Adam. Um, yeah, th things like you, you're working from home. If you're not used to working from home, you know, you mentioned before that you know it's a luxury to have an office, and to be fair, it is. Uh, but also, you could be on the kitchen table, you could be on your sofa in the living room, and it's. I think a lot of it's down to posture as well. You know, so are we going to have problems in the future where people have got bad backs and bad necks because they're hunched over uh, computers in the wrong environment, potentially? Um, uh, but but I think also it's you know it comes down to perhaps a, a few questions as you know where does Jane want to work you know where where does Jane uh, need to work and where can Jane work and I think by those three questions Jane's going to come up with the right location whether that's a blend of home and office or it could be a, some sort of collaboration space. Um, yeah, I, I think a lot of this it, it's it's new territory, and once things start getting back to normal, then you know Jane's and a lot of other Jane's around the country are going to hopefully find a blend, uh, and I think it is going to be different to uh, to what it was uh, you know pre-COVID. Yeah, I agree. I think um, I think PR we talked the other day about um, so you've got a scenario at home at the moment with a, a I wouldn't say interloping son, but a returning family member working out of your uh, about out of your house, which is causing you some logistical challenges. But I guess we also talked about you know if there was a space near to us where we could access it safely and in a controlled way, and it had spaces fit for the type of work we wanted to do, we would be we would be there like a shop right you know to go and you know look for colleagues and collaborate um so it'd be great to get your insights into sort of talking about um accessing those spaces um getting away from sort of scenarios where that aren't conducive to sort of home working um, um and i know you've almost been booted out of your own your own office right by uh, especially in the morning by your um son who's back from dubai right yeah it's interesting and and, and what i would think is what we found is that the traditional places that we would go to um, to work, you know, the Starbucks, the you know, the coffee bar, um, you know, those social places that have been around for years, just don't really work anymore. Mm. Because, you know, it was it's great to go to a Starbucks and do some work. If now you've got four or five Zoom calls in your schedule, um, which we're probably now going to get used to more than ever, because you know we are now going to have that kind of mix. You can't really do them very easily in Starbucks because of noise and privacy and, and security. Um, so we're looking for another place. Um, and that other place may not exist mm -hmm. in my local community. Yeah, for sure, it might exist in a city where there's lots of, you know, agile worker workplaces that you could pay for by the hour. But where I live, and maybe where you all live, that isn't necessarily available. So what is my choice? A noisy Starbucks where people can hear what I'm saying, like a video call like this, which is not really acceptable. Stay at home where, you know, let's be honest, there is fluctuations in the, the environment for, for me personally and others, I'm sure, whether that's quality mm. Wi-Fi. But as you say, also, you know, I've got a new arrival in my house who he <laughs> access to Wi-Fi and, you know, wants to, you know, get the lamp and everything else. Um, so does that fourth place, which you could call it that, 
you know, does that fourth place need to be created? And if it does, who's going to create it? Could it be that other industries, retail, hospitality, looking for ways to reinvent the high street and, you know, business parks and other things, could they become the people that say, look, if you want a quiet booth, let's say, that you could walk to or cycle to, um, I'll provide it to you. And, you know, tick a number of boxes that at the moment right now you can't do. And, you know, when I think about my own circumstance, there is nowhere I can go right now to do this unless I do it in my house. Now, you know, let's fix that problem then, because I'm sure I'm one of millions. And, and does that create this new hybrid workplace? So that, that may be the biggest thing that I think is, is interesting. And your listeners may come back on this and say, actually, Paul, that's already in existence. Um, and, you know, so-and-so are doing it. And, you know, let's amplify what they're up to. So I'd be, it'd be intriguing to hear people come back to you on, on the webinar to say, yeah, we've already invented this fourth place and it looks like this. Yeah, I think it's a really good. We talked about this before, right? This this fourth place or fourth space concept, um, where it, it it provides the maybe the in between, um, you know, an option whether it's sort of provided by your organisation in a capacity through hybrid, or whether it's the the sort of devolvement of sort of real estate spends, where we're seeing companies sort of give their their employees cash and saying, right, you know, you're not in the workplace now um, for a certain period of time. So here is here is an allowance to set up your, your home office or your home space or to pay for a co-working or to access uh, a space where you feel comfortable. Um, so we're seeing all these different scenarios. We're seeing uh, com uh, companies incorporate sort of um, a standard measure of home office space in their, their workplace strategy. Um, if they're using less space, there's all sorts of scenarios. You know, using less space, do they relinquish that in terms of sort of accounting and, and FAS being for 16 um, as they consolidate their corporate role? So there's always different scenarios. But I guess, I guess you know, for the employee, if a company can get that perfect balance of access to space, work-life balance, empowerment to do their role, um, and the ability to collaborate, but also to deliver upon their job, there's a certain element companies need to think about in terms of retention and, and sort of employee satisfaction. So if you're empowering your employee to be independent, but they can still deliver in this new scenario, then why would they ever want to leave the business? So, you know, the balance would be for, 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 for people like us. We have a space you can go to, um, and Newmark are doing that now for us, for us now, which is great, um, to access. But you could go there only when you really need to. Um, and when it's necessary for you to do a certain element of your job, um, that's great. I've been given a, a resource and provision that helps support me through what is, you know, a, a very fluid scenario. Um, so, you know, hybrid's one uh, way of looking at that. Sort of devolvement of corporate real estate spend to the to the people is one of that. One of those, so you can spend that yourself. Um, or maybe it's you know, a subscription service to multiple locations, maybe like co-working, where you can just sort of flash your, your corporate corporate badge and in you go, um, but in a safe and controlled way, um, which is, you know, co-working, I have to think about that in a massive in a massive way, because, you know, before they're all about collaboration and free movement and so sort of circulation space and, and desk sharing, you know, which is one of the, the biggest sort of elements of control from a platform perspective we have to sort of look at, um, including access. So if you can answer all of that, um, but also be agile in terms of sort of adopting new ways of working, expansion, collaborate, uh, contraction of spaces or, or repurposing of spaces to look after it, um, you know, you're going to try and start to get the right balance of, of space for, 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 you, for yourself and your employees. And that's the driver for for real estate professionals in that space now. So we, here we have Dave, who's our head of real estate. So Dave's now got the challenge of, of providing all these new wants and needs for his employees. So obviously, you know, he's got the classic cost pressures, um, operational elements to keep to keep moving, but also providing space, you know, as a service or space as an extension of a, of a, of a company brand and identity um, to, to, his, to his employees. Um, both to keep the business operating, but also to keep employees happy. Um, and he can't be everywhere at once, right? He'll need technology and platforms to to manage his hybrid locations, should that be a route he goes down, um, and to make sure they're being adopted in, in the right way. And I guess maybe maybe to, to Priyash, um, there are tool sets out there, which I know IBM has been looking at and developing sort of internally for its own use, but also for its clients, where um, you can start to help um, sort of real estate professionals in the sort of, in the sort of, baseline area, manage that reboarding, 
um, but in the longer term, utilize the sort of wider benefits of an IDMS platform. And we'll get onto that in a little bit more detail in a bit, but you're certainly looking at things now, right? That's my understanding. Yeah, and uh, the reason is, is because Dave, in this case, has access and exposure to a lot more information on his employees in the last six months than he did before mm. about their needs and wants. So before a lot of that, people might have hidden it from, from the workspace. They wanted to separate those things. But the situation we're in is merged those things together. And I think what it's also done is it's shown corporations what people really want out of their, out of their job. And, it, and it's shown the employees what they want because they might have never had that ability to be flexible and all of a sudden they've been given it and they're like well i'm just as productive as i was i'm happier i get to spend more time with my family i don't have to commute so now what can my employer do to keep that going when we return to the work what what can we have in place to, to allow that so that whole push to workplace experience is is going to be accelerated especially because you you've, you're used to the technology you know obviously there was there was that that point in the industry where there was a big, big disparity in technology that you had in home and versus the office. And I think um, that's going to become much more um, similar and it needs to because that's what people expect. Um, you'll see you'll see here what Dave talked about most is flexibility. And I mm. think that's really important. So the tooling that, you know, we've been working on, we've had lots of tools in place. You know, uh, IWS has been around for a long time. Being able to reserve hot desks has been around for a long time, but people didn't use um, because they said, well, we don't necessarily need to. We can use first come, first serve. Uh, there's no problem. All of a sudden, it becomes a problem. You need to know mm -hmm. who's using the space. You want to be able to do contact tracing. You want to give people the um, confidence to be able to return to the workplace, knowing that cleaning is happening mm -hmm. and passes are being checked and all of this, th these things are happening. So it's really accelerated the adoption. It, in IBM, it has, and it has with a lot of our customers with with this technology that's existed for a while it's just not been used in this way and um, so i think it's really pushed people like dave to say well what do we have already we don't necessarily have to even adopt new things how can we extend what we've got and what functionalities we're not using and uh, how how can we pivot to more to the flexibility perspective and the experience perspective versus the you know just about optimization and 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 workplace maintenance and other things yeah, I think you make a really good point around um, having so having a problem and solving it, which I know is you know obviously a, a key sort of focus and driver for IBM as an organisation. Um, and it's you know it's a very poignant point. It's not about having a knee jerk reaction to anything. It's about like just stopping, taking stock, and saying right, this is a situation. These are the drivers we're seeing. What do I have in my current sort of ecosystem, whether that be a space or or partner or technology ecosystem that can support me in in managing these problems that are here now? But I know they're going to change. They're going to evolve um, in a very short period of time. Um, I mean, who'd have who'd have thought we had we have a vaccine? You know, within the same year as the pandemic really broke out. You know, it's unprecedented collaboration globally around sort of getting this this sort of thing done. Um, it's, you know, it's a fantastic feat. And we saw the the first um, the first lady, I think, in Northern Ireland yesterday get the vaccine, which is, you know, a humongous moment for, for us. But, you know, that starts to eke in confidence and and a bit more sort of, okay, well, I can see the light in the tunnel here, um, which means maybe I can get back out to, to normal life, including work and workplace. Um, and as that, that demand starts to creep and that confidence starts to come back, you know, real estate professionals think, okay, well, I've got to catch these guys coming back to work now. What can I do to provide space in a controlled way? Because risk still remains. And we talked about this before, risk still remains and managing that risk uh, and the social elements of that, which will come to you shortly. Um, but I guess for a real estate professional, if they can shorten commutes, leverage their current platform, um, provide space that will suit the, the sort of new employee different needs and support the balance around work from home, working from the office, um, but also keep the operation going because we all know real estate operations is a, a critical contributor to the very products that people make or deliver and also embody a company's brand, a physical manifestation of a brand, um, then, then he's probably on the right track in the early days of, of sort of this 
there's an upward confidence trend that we're probably going to start to see from from the vaccine news and you know stock markets going up and, and work you know and, and doing people going back to work in a, in, a, in, a, in a more comprehensive way but also the isolation of the impact of the pandemic um, to only certain sectors um, who've been heavily hit hospitality we all know has been absolutely um, and, and retail been really hit hard by it but other sectors have gone absolutely through the roof um, but as we get that confidence back, more people are going to be coming back to the office and those drivers are going to become a reality and they have to be able to adopt the, and adapt to that, um, but also manage it. And that's where technology comes into play as well. Um, yeah, fascinating. Um, so when we talk about sort of hybrid strategy is one of the options to to take into account for, for managing these, these new sort of drivers. Um, you've got to take into account sort of four sort of processes. Uh, that's that's the Newmark way of looking at it, um, and that's looking at employee locations. Where do employees live um, at the moment? Where's the, the you know, talent is dispersed? We know that um, we can access talent more widely through tools like we're using today and and discussion based um, sort of work. Um, Webex, Teams, Slack, you know, huge boom in 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 those tools. I think even think I saw the other day that Slack has been acquired by Salesforce for a, a hefty sum. So clearly. People are seeing a future in that in, in a fantastic um, acquisition by by Salesforce there, um, um, and we're a Slack user um, in in Newmark and we love it. Um, but it really, what we're looking at here is around sort of where your employees are, what's the value of a location in a hybrid model to support them, not just monetary, but also from a sort of provision risk resilience perspective um, make sure that space is fit for purpose it's not just there um, implementing it so you still have to go through the same old process in terms of acquisition the, the, the location acquisition the transaction the setup the control um, but also i think more importantly we, and we come to point four here and we focus in on it is around um, once i've got locations set up how do i manage the sort of safe reboarding of those locations how do i understand how they're being used in what capacity and by who and, and when so that I can make sure that do I need to expand, contract, control that space, reconfigure it to to suit this fluid need in terms of space as people start to come back to the office in, in, in sort of larger and larger droves. Um, and, and that's where technology comes into play, I think. I know it's not it's going to answer everything, and we've, we've talked about this before, um, but it's going to provide a platform upon which to be able to manage those scenarios. Um, and, and and this is really where I'm looking forward to getting the insights from you guys around this, because with new locations become set up, we're going to see new, more com complex space agreements, lease to order leases. We're going to be people's, people's paying a premium for the agility and flexibility in those leases, the ability to sort of expand and contract or get out of them where required. But, onboarding them, locations, managing them from a financial perspective, services, you know, still need to clean these places, maintain them, make sure protocols are followed, um, see, you know, who's reserving the desks as per company policy, but even getting the, into the office in the first place um, in the right way is is a, a big topic that's coming up. And I guess, you know, not to go on too much about the, the vaccine myself, but I want to get your insights on this, probably starting with, um, with PR, is you've got your locations, your employees are wanting to use them because they want to collaborate, want to innovate and want to meet up with their colleagues and their friends to do more focused work and escape their immediate environment that we, we're stuck in. Um, but I guess trust and, and compliance, two elements driven by the vaccine. Um, what if I don't want the vaccine? You know, for example, or what if I haven't had it yet? Or I haven't, I'm not in the queue. How do we, how do we manage those sorts of, safe returns whether it be health checks or i think you guys are looking at passport as well which is a fascinating process um for getting back into the office and those sort of procedures we can put in place to keep people safe um but also to allow our workplace to be accessed in a safe way so uh pr i know you've got a, a bit to talk about around this It'd be great to hear your your insights in sort of that um that sort of area that that sort of twilight area between you know the front door and in the office and the scenarios between there and i think um, the whole passport discussion is one that um is quite fascinating yeah absolutely um and i think you know what what what's now emerging is is the sort of practicalities you know you know what what would i do in the next 90 days mm. i had to map it out starting today Knowing what I know, and let's say you know the, the vaccine is is uppermost in people's minds, um, and if let's say you know I I've worked out for my business to function better, in the next ninety days I need to open my offices. So let's just imagine that scenario. 
what what what's some what do I need to do? And so one of the thoughts is, you know, is access um, and this this emerging thought process about people who've had the vaccine or people who've chosen not to have the vaccine. And let's just, let's assume the next 90 days, the majority of us won't have a vaccine. What, what, what do I do to start to make sure that the workplace is safe? That is that I, you know, adhere to people's privacy and choice, but at the same time, make my workplace as safe as it possibly can be. So that then brings into the scenarios of that kind of balance between vaccination and testing. Um, and, you know, are there going to be the rules of access based on people's situation and you know and if there are what technologies can i use um, if there is a technology answer to do that and so one of the things that ibm have uh, introduced recently is this digital health pass um, like a wallet um, and that uses you know you know that being too technical that uses you know some really cool um trusted um technological blockchain um to ensure that you know if we are using this wallet it is trusted and uh, valid and um, so therefore the data quality is high and it also protects the individual's privacy but most importantly at the same time gives you a way to make sure people who are accessing your buildings as compliant as you can possibly make make it which i think for corporate real estate is going to be huge pressure for them to ensure that yeah whilst whilst my spaces are clean and you know i'm doing lots of different things in terms of making them much more sustainable. And I've been doing this for months, which is for facility management, I suppose. I'm also making sure I've got access control sorted. And, and what I would say to summarize then is I think there's been a consolidation of these five aspects, which I think comes from other industries. And the five aspects are, how have I designed my workplace? How have I built it in terms of the, 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 the mechanics, the tools and the processes? How does it then operate in a day-to-day -day basis? So what changes have I got to make to ensure I'm, I'm compliant? What is the function I'm trying to achieve? I'm a hotel, I'm a bank, I'm a government office. How am I still sustaining what I do? And most importantly, what is the social outcome? And I think that's the biggest thing I would underline is this coming together of the social outcome. Because if I do all these things, but actually, I make it really hard for people to want to come into my office because I've made it quite draconian and, you know, almost like, you know, less trustworthy. Uh, am I going to put people off? And then if, what is the knock on effect if people just don't turn up? So I've got to really come together with an exciting experience driven uh, way of bringing people into the office. But at the same time, use some tools that ensure that I'm compliant and making it safe. Uh, and I think that's where IBM have been doing some work. And again, the next 90 days, there's quite a few things that people in a pragmatic way and a previous mentioned earlier about a playbook is to come up with a playbook that works for their organization. We've published ours that actually they can use as their toolkit um, to get a 90 day plan sorted. Yeah, that's great. And you know, we, we, we did the same thing for our clients. Again, as you say, through our FM organization to support that, um, along with making um, sort of COVID data dashboards free to our clients as well. And you know, not to sell anything to our clients, but just to, to help them make informed decisions. You know, we're all in the same boat for a period. Um, but I think you're right. I think uh, fascinated by that, the blockchain uh, for the health check piece. I think it's incredibly, it's a great application in a real sort of life scenario for the application of blockchain, which I think maybe, maybe Maybe for the masses is still something they're they're working to discover and understand in more detail. But I think you know that sort of passport wallet approach um, is a great way, a great personalised way um, to help people sort of understand and own that that sort of element of going back to the office. So they they're empowered to say, right, you know, I've done my processes, I am safe, and I'm going to go back to the office, not just for their own their own good, but also um, for the good of their employees and the safety of their employees, but also their families as they come and, and come back and from from the workplace as well so what we're going to do now is a classic webinar style we're going to try we're going to try and transition seamlessly from from my screen share to uh to, to priya's screen share um and as pg is currently the host of our, our webinar it's up to him to deliver a seamless transition from 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 me talking at you um over to priya she's going to look at some of our uh, some of the uh, the sort of tri about elements um of the topics we've just talked about so paul I'll teach you up there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks, Adam. Uh, I believe uh, Priya should just be able to take uh, control, and it should seamlessly move to his screen. I believe. There we go. Look at that. 
Uh, Look yeah. at that. Seamless. Love it. Almost yeah. if we've rehearsed it. <laughs> oh, almost. Exactly. And uh, yeah, so <laughs> this has just happened to be the digital health pass that, that we were talking about. And, um, you know, uh, if you wanted to learn more information, it's all on here. But uh, what, I, what I wanted to talk about is what else are we doing in this, in this space? You know, we've talked about the, the health pass wallet, and that's a really good way to, to ensure um, privacy, but also trust and tr transparency. I think that's going to be the biggest thing is how do you ensure trust between employees, employers, make sure the information is all um, consolidated and that's where the blockchain comes in. Um, but then how else and what else can we do with, with the with the information and how can we instill confidence um, with the employees coming back? Because having the passes is, is, is all well and good, but you've still got to you know, want them to come back to the office and, and be happy in that process. So there's a, there's a few things that we've been um, working on or, or using within IBM. So we're obviously a user of, of, of the, the Chariga solution internally. And, and the first thing we needed to do was react to the, uh, the changing circumstances in February and March. So we were le leveraging the data source, you know, as I mentioned earlier, how do you understand Who's, who's at risk of exposure? What's their exposure risk? Who can work from home? Who's essential to the office? So being able to have all of that information in one place and being able to react in it, and you can see like in, in exposure risk here in the different buildings for the different numbers of people um, that are in those buildings. We can scroll down and see, you know, which groups are these people in? Are they essential to the office? If I scroll to the right here, um, do they have the ability to work from home? This is what I alluded to earlier. And then being able to run um, projects. So if we need to move people from from offices to home, and obviously now we're going the other other way, um, can we have pre-built um, projects to do those things? And you can see some examples here of flood, earthquake, of obviously the current pandemic. Um, and this is what drives those things. You know, those procedures that I was we were talking about, and, and and PR just mentioned from a playbook perspective. So that's reacting to it. Then what we need to think about and what the space planners and Dave that we were looking at earlier needs to think about is what, what do we need to do to our buildings? Because we can't use them in the, in the same way. So if I just go to this, uh, this is a second floor of one of the buildings. Um, the, this is a Charlotte Watson Center. And what do we need to do to the second floor to make it COVID secure, right? And how do we adapt to the changing circumstances? I think, Adam, you said, you know, the policy is always going to be changing. Currently, you know, we have a three-tiered system in the UK. That can change depending on the tier, depending on, on who can and can't go to, to places of work, depending on the industry, and just, you know, decides how close people can be to each other. So what we did was we worked with our and uh, we created this tool. So this is taking our standard, you know, takes a standard floor plan that, you know, lots of solutions will have. Um, and we can do things like run different reports on the floor plan. So you might want to, you know, change the space types based on the, the, the needs in, in, the, in the future, in the next 90 days versus what you had in the past. Um, but what we can do here is we can say, well, we've got all of these spaces. And currently, you know, as we, me and um, PG were talking to a client um, yesterday, actually, and they're manually going through their floor plans and deciding, you know, which spaces can and can't be used. What's the current legislation asking for? Um, if that changes, we have to manually go through the floor plan and decide which desks are going to be, you know, disabled and can't be used. And then we have to go obviously walk around and put an X on them. Um, what we did was work with research and say, well, if we can, we just build that in algorithmically. So we've got this distance factor tool. Click the button. In this case, the floor plans in inches. Um, so it's set it to six feet, and you can see it's taken all of the um, the desks and it's and it's and it's highlighted the desks you can use based on the distance factor. So all of the desks in the lighter blue, it says you shouldn't use to maintain that social distancing. If everyone sat at one of those dark blue desks, now if that distance factor suddenly changed, we can see it's dynamically running against the floor plan to show you what you can and can't do from a, from, a, from a capacity perspective. And obviously, if, if, the, if it gets relaxed and gets pulled down, then you can see the availability increase. Okay. So, the idea, so, so the concept of this is um, we have our baseline floor plan. What we can then do is we can create scenarios um, 
depending on the circumstances and the location. So, you know, the scenarios that you might run against a UK office are going to be different to the scenarios that you might run against a German office or an Italian office, depending on what's going on at the moment. Are we in a second wave or in a third wave? Are we between waves? The vaccine rollout is obviously going to affect some of this. Um, but what you can do is you can, you know, you can, you can automatically calculate distance. Uh, you can then say, well, what we're going to do is just work on the deck as those are the things that are, uh, are important from a social distancing perspective. What we want to do is we want to select those spaces that, um, if I just drag select here, um, select the spaces that are unavailable. So we can see it's highlighted those. And then we can do things in bulk. So this is what, this is being able to react quickly, right? Instead of going to individual spaces, can we change those space details, change the capacity of them to zero and change, you know, the type to excluded. Um, so you can see in, in, in 20 seconds, I've just done that. Um, can we reallocate those spaces? So if we, if we look at the, um, the charge to organization, we can see the different the different parts of the business that are paying for those spaces. Now they can't use them; they're unavailable. So can we just reallocate them in bulk uh, and and charge you know change the charge to organisation back to facility services? Let's say so we can replace those. So now those so now you know from a from a space use agreement. I think Adam, you were talking about before. Mm. You know, they they don't have to worry about paying for space they can't use. The capacity of the floor has now been reduced as well. Um, and social distancing has been implemented. Now, what we're doing is we're doing this all against a scenario. So we can create multiple scenarios for multiple different variables and um, change the spaces accordingly. Now, the other thing that, that people are going to be worried about is um, fixed desks. So places where people are sat. Now, being able to understand who's allocated to space is a pretty typical thing that we can do in solutions like this. Um, but what we're doing within this scenario is we're giving the, uh, the, the space planner the ability to move people. So you can spread people out to ensure social distancing. So you can see I'm just doing that through drag and drop here. Um, but another thing we can do here is, again, if we select unavailable spaces and, you know, what we select a block of spaces, we might realise that we just don't have the capacity so it might have had capacity for 200 people and there's 200 people allocated. We'd now reduce the capacity to 100 due to social distancing. We just need to remove people in bulk. Um, so again, this is something we can do. So we can remove people from bulk. We can put them in the left here. And then what we can do is we can we can add those people to one of those move projects that I was talking about earlier. So you might move them to another floor, another building. You might say that for this, for this stage, they have to work from home. And um, some customers are, are saying, you know, Half half the the floor will come in, you know, Monday, Tuesday, and then the half comes in, you know, Thursday, Friday, that that kind of thing. So those are the kinds of scenarios we can run here, and we can save we can save these, and these these aren't affecting the base floor plan. These are just changing the scenarios um, at the scenario level. Now, the final thing I wanted to talk about is reservations. The one thing we've done in IBM, you know, we talked about the agility to change to the circumstances. We've enabled. Um, desk reservation in over 450 locations in the last um, three or four months. And, and the reason we're able to do that is because we're holding all of the space information in Trireliga already. And then what we can say is we, we want to select available spaces. And in my case, the light green spaces here are my hot desks. Um, and what we want to do is we want to change them from being first come first serve to um, adding them to the reservation system. And just through that one click, um, we can do that within this scenario. So we can ensure that people are not coming to the office unless they've got a reserved space. And the way that we can show that is just running, you know, running the reservable report here. And you can see we've got some meeting rooms that were reservable before before I made the change. But now all of these hot desks are now added to the reservation system. And so this is the tooling that we're using um, within within the business. And obviously our, our customers are also using to understand those changes. Now, the important thing is, is that all of this is being saved against the scenario record in the background. And what it means is we can process those changes. You can see space changes, organization changes, res you know, reservation changes, whatever it might be. But we also have the ability to revert. And this is quite important because a lot of these policies are going to be temporary. So being able to apply the changes to the base and also revert back 
is 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 pretty important and also the ability to create new scenarios in the future as and when your policy changes also becomes important so that's that's the aspect you know you talked about managing and and analyzing so that that's what we're we're doing from that aspect um, from a, from a reservation aspect i'm not going to go into this in massive detail but just to show you kind of we've effectively enhanced our our self service to pull in data from our return to work um, tool within Watson Health. So effectively, before you're allowed to make a reservation, and you can see it at the bottom there, you have to do a self-assessment. So you do a self-assessment, you answer a survey, you get a work pass, which is going to be part of this digital health pass that that PR talked about. And then once you've got a valid pass for today, you can then make a reservation. This is another thing we've enhanced our capability with in the last few months to, to bring those data sources together um, because we have that within Watson Health, we have that within, within Tririga. How can we leverage that in this way to make the employee experience better and give them comfortability when they're moving back to the workplace? And then finally, it's all about monitoring. So you've set this up, you've reduced your capacities, you've enhanced your reservation capability. But how do you understand what's really going on in your buildings? And that's where a tool like Building Insights comes into play, where you can really monitor what's going on. And I think that the challenge that a lot of customers are having with monitoring is sensor deployment. So sensors can be expensive to deploy, especially if you're trying to do floor level occupancy. Um, they're useful for things like maybe desks and meeting rooms, um, but to understand full well, floor level um, heat maps, et cetera, can be rather um, time consuming and expensive to implement, especially if it's temporary. So what we've done is we've collaborated with um, Cisco and that allows us to use the Wi-Fi in the building as a sensor. So without any additional implementation of sensors, we can understand Wi-Fi and understand floor level occupancy just using Wi-Fi access. So here we've got a, a building. Uh, you can see this is against the last 30 days and you can see that you know the changes during the pandemic uh, uh, from you know the last six months to the last seven days or or the last day if you wish and then you can see in this case we've got the different floors of this building so taking the second floor as an example this capacity might have reduced because we did the we did the scenario so some of that is allocated to to organizations and then you can see how much of it in the last month has been used on average as a peak so this informs you as to whether you're adhering to the capacity and it also helps you make decisions on restacks because you might say, well, actually, if this is our occupancy rate for the next, for the last 30 days and we don't think it's going to change, then maybe we can consolidate down to two floors, shut down a couple of floors and have reduced staffing levels. And um, we can see that in, in further detail below where we get an overarching view of what's going on against the whole building. And what we're leveraging here is um, artificial intelligence or what's an AI. So it's taking the information, but what we don't want is, is spikes and troughs to, um, to affect our decision making. So what this does is it, it detects anomalies, it removes those from the data based on, based on historical data and it normalizes that information. So it's AI that's understanding that, it's understanding working days, non-working days, all of that. So, so the decisions you make and the information you get is, is useful to make those um, those you know those decisions now the final thing i kind of wanted to talk about from from this perspective is also understanding density so if i um look at this this is telling me what's happened in the last month or or the last week or whatever it might be and we can go down to the floor level and understand you know at the floor level which organizations are using the space and we can also look at that on the floor plan and and see what's going on historically um, but what we also want to understand is density and this is becoming a, a problem. So let's say we've got this floor. How do we ensure there aren't any choke points when people are moving around the floor? So what we can do is if I just go back to this explore, is we can look at a near real-time dashboard. So if we look at the second floor again, what this is showing us is a heat map for the last 15 minutes as to what's going on in our floor. And we can see there's a problem. There's high density in this corridor here. So a lot of people are passing each other coming from the lift and going to the spaces. So what this can inform is your decision to, to change the layout of the floor, maybe put down signage um, to try and alleviate this and have multiple routes to different parts of that floor um, to reduce the density, just to reduce people's risk 
that they might be passing each other a lot in a corridor, for example. So these are the technologies that you can potentially leverage in different ways, as I've said, um, to, to inform you as in, in, in real estate and make changes in capacity and layout um, to meet current policy. Fantastic. I think it's great. And I think, you know, like you said, you're you're moving this around, you're creating scenarios and it's taking you, you know, seconds and minutes to, to do so, which is which is exactly what's needed right in such a, an agile and fluid sort of scenario. So thank you very much, Priya. It's great to see what, what capabilities are out there in terms of sort of Trirega and how it's sort of quickly jumped on. Um but also leverages foundations, right? Foundation functionality to to solve an issue which, you know, we've talked about problems throughout this sort of webinar. Um um, and, and great to see that so uh, that's that's it's accessible. Um, and I know you know you've got lots of content online. If people want to go and look at it, um, or if you want to know more about that sort of space, then then reach out to any of the fine gentlemen on this webinar, and they'll they'll take you through what's um, what's what's there. Um, so you know we're coming to the end of our discussion now, guys. Um, hopefully we've given the listeners a, a taste of um, sort of how to maybe look at managing their, their spaces in the hybrid process moving forward. We've talked about some of the scenarios coming through and some of the trends and discussions around um, vaccines and passports and and sort of safety generally moving forward as well, which is a great debate. Um, we've looked at technology that can support people. Um, should they look at um, different models in terms of hybrid or hub and spoke or whatever suits their industry in the best way, um, but also looking at technology um, from, from IBM and with previous demonstration around what's capable uh, capability out there to sort of manage those different elements um, in an agile and sort of fluid way. So so I guess that brings us nicely to, to our, our, our ends. Um, and uh, now it's now to seamlessly pass back to the, the closing slide, Paul, um, as if we'd uh, as if as if we'd um, practiced it. So I'm now going to try. You should, you should just be able to share, Adam. Take it back. Here we go. Look at that as if we had practiced it. Um, and all it leaves me now to say is thank you very much for, for IBM um, to join us. So thank you to Paul Gatlin, to Paul Russell, to Priyesh for your time today. Um, thank you to our listeners for taking the time out to, to listen to what we had to say. Hopefully you found it insightful um, and, uh, and we'll no doubt hopefully see you on another uh, webinar again soon. So we'll finish there with saying thank you again for listening. Um, stay safe and, uh, and have a, a great sort of Christmas break um, to you all. Um, and I'm sure we'll see each other again soon. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Adam.